to share with you that starting next Wednesday night, we're going to do a, a teaching series on Wednesday nights, a four-part series on the book of Second Peter. And I hope you will come. It's called The Development of Character. I just finished a wonderful book by a pastor friend, Michelle Woodruff. Uh, some of you may know Michelle. She's the associate pastor at Lifeway Church here in town. And she wrote a really beautiful book um, called, uh, it's, it's called Exposed. And it uses the idea of before the time of digital photography, when you actually had to develop film the old fashioned way, the process for developing film, and then she uses that as a picture for how to develop character in our lives. And so a lot of what I'll be sharing will come from uh, Michelle's book, and I really recommend it to you if, if you would like to um, read a, a wonderful book. Uh, look up Michelle Woodruff, Exposed, and you can get it on Amazon or whatnot. You can probably even call her up and get a copy um, just from her. So, But that teaching series will start next Wednesday night, and then it'll last four weeks, and I, I hope you will be here Second Peter is a wonderful, wonderful book. And this is something that I'm sort of tag teaming with the series that we just finished called The Journey. You can think of this again like a component piece of the discipleship journey that we're on. Um, God wants to develop character in each of our lives. And then I wanted to just mention also that um, starting this Sunday, I'm beginning a new series, and so I hope you will be here for the Sunday morning sessions, and um, it's going to be about faith and the struggle of faith. Many times we like to hear the glory of faith and the victories of faith. There is a dignity in the struggle of faith, too. And so I hope you'll come, it'll be these next several weeks as we're talking about the struggle of faith on Sunday mornings. Hey, invite your friends. We, we've been having wonderful crowds on Sunday mornings. Um, last Sunday was Youth Day, and I mean, they just, they hit it out of the ballpark right over the center field fence. I mean, it was a fabulous day. I was so proud of our young people. I, I'm so thankful that, um, hey, we've got kids that love God. They just go after God with all of their hearts, and I praise the Lord for that. Now, tonight I, I want you to turn to the book of Genesis, and let's study for a few minutes the life of Isaac. I've always liked the name Isaac. Um, when you hear it in Hebrew, it doesn't quite roll off the tongue as smooth and pretty. The name is Hitchcock. It doesn't quite have this yet. <laughs> and Hitchcock means he laughs. It means laughter. I love the story of Isaac. It is a beautiful story. You know, Isaac is one of my heroes because he's, he runs buffer. He runs uh, interference. You, you hear the name Isaac often combined with his father and with his son. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Abraham, father of the nation. Father of nations, I should say. Father Abraham. And, uh, the man of favor with God and rich, rich blessing. Jacob. Jacob, again, very notorious. Uh, his name means, means heel grabber. It's a way of saying uh, swindler, horse thief. And for the first 20 so years of his life, he looked up to his name. But he had an encounter with God in the, in the middle of the night with a messenger of God, some feel possibly even, maybe he was wrestling with a pre-incarnate uh, appearance of Christ himself. 
though the text leaves a lot of ambiguity there, but Isaac, I mean, uh, Jacob says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And so he was, his name was changed that day. His name was changed from horse thief to Israel. One who wrestles with God, who struggles with God. There is in the Hebrew culture a respect and an admiration for wrestling with God that doesn't quite translate into American culture because we, we want to be respectful, we want to be honorable. But there is that Jewish thought that um, Israel, he, he's God wrestler. He would not let go until he's blessed. So, Abraham, father of nations. Isaac, uh, Abraham, father of nations. Jacob, God wrestler. Changes the name of the nation of Israel, the blessed people of God. In the middle, Isaac, running interference. <coughs> Isaac, the, the mediator, in a sense. I love his, his life. I, I, I love his story. <clears throat> like I told you, his name means he laughs. And there's so much laughter surrounding Isaac's um, birth. And just, I don't have to tell you this. I, typically, the Wednesday night crowd is well versed in scripture, and, and you guys will remember this. And I'll, I'll paraphrase different parts of the story, but, but you remember that Abraham was well advanced in years, let's say probably 99 years old. And uh, Sarah is early 90s, well, well past childbearing years at the very least. And they get the news from the messengers who come to visit them. Next time when we come back to visit you, you will have a, a child. Just put yourself in their shoes for a moment. <laughs> and, and Sarah, hearing it, uh, and apparently on the other side of the tent, <laughs> laughs. And the messenger says, why did you laugh? And what does Sarah do? Oh, not me, I wouldn't laugh. I wasn't laughing, and there is no, uh, it, there is no explaining or or anything when you're talking to God. And I, I kind of think this is what Judgment Day is going to be like. He, he didn't take her with her and go back and forth. He's just simply, yes, you did. I mean, what are you going to say to that? Yeah, you did. You laughed. Now, Abraham, on the other hand, laughed too. But he doesn't try to hide his laughter. And I, I am putting the Keith Howard translation on it, and I, I understand it, and I know. But to me, it sort of comes off, uh, to me, a good reading of the text. He just, <laughs> me, have a kid, come on, God, what are you talking about? I mean, I'm, have you looked at how old I am? Look at Sarah. I, you wouldn't play with us, would you? Come on, God, are you, is this a mean joke? Are you being, is this a practical joke? <laughs> but the scripture says he believed God and what and God credited it to him as righteousness so comes time for the baby to be born and what do they name it what would you name laughter I mean that's perfect that makes perfect sense we are holding the fulfillment of promise and don't you think they just had a belly aching laugh as they are holding little baby Isaac? The, the fulfillment of promise. Amen. Um, there's a remarkable story about Isaac that is found in Genesis chapter 22. The story is about Abraham, but the story is also about Isaac. And just looking at verses 6 through 8, uh, if, if you're not familiar with the story, you, I think you are, but God tells Abraham, take Isaac, the child of promise, journey up on top of the mountain, and there I want you to sacrifice him to me. Silence. Let it just sink in. I mean, 
all those years wanted a child, hoped for a child, gave up on having a child. So it's just not going to happen. Then the promise is spoken. Then they receive the child. Now they're holding the child. They're laughing. It's the pride of his life. Abraham will take that child of promise, go up on the mountain, sacrifice it. So, but just these verses, verses 6 through 8, I won't read the whole story. And Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father... And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. This is... This has just simply got to be the most intimate moment between a, a dad and his son imaginable. Isaac, um, there's different speculation about how old he was. Some have him, you know, as a, a, a little boy. Um, but he's articulate. He's old enough to understand, you know, there's, there's a, we need a lamb for the sacrifice. Others say, well, actually he may have... He would have probably, at this point in the journey, been um, a, an older teenager with the strength to fight back. And it shows a, a great deal of surrender on his part, if that's the case. And like I said, Scripture doesn't specifically tell us. But it's, it's an amazing encounter. Now, um, some of the greatest minds in history have tried to wrestle with this Scripture. And... Um, one guy is, is a guy from the 1800s who was a philosopher, and he, he was a believer, um, a man of faith. I, I guess I would be cautious to say because I, his faith probably wouldn't be the same as our faith, the way we express our faith in the Lord. But, um, but he did study the scriptures and uh, his name was Soren Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard means, uh, interestingly, it means churchyard. And uh, Kirk is the church part, guard is yard, Kierkegaard, churchyard. And literally what it meant was um, cemetery. Because you remember in those days, the cemetery was always right next to the church. They called that the churchyard. And so um, he... He seemed to have real bouts with depression, and I guess so. I mean, when you go around with, what's your name, Howard? My, I'm Howard, what's your name? Uh, graveyard. I mean, <laughs> that's a tough one to explain. Um, but anyway, he, he wrestled with this, this text and, and came up with four different scenarios of what it would have been like. And, and it, he was, um, he was a, a philosopher, and he has this famous phrase that he used, and it, it's a real $9 phrase, teleological suspension of the ethical. <coughs> teleological, telos means end, like telos in, in Revelation is uh, a word speaking of end time. Um, suspension just means we're, we're going to suspend it for right now, and then ethical means the good. Teleological suspension of the ethical, and it means it's the age-old question Put it on the back burner, or here, here's a better way of saying it, um, doing something that might be wrong because the end justifies the means. So, in, so here's, that, that was his famous phrase that he came up with for how to describe this. He, he says, and see what makes it curious though, is that this is, this is not a man initiating this, this is God initiating this. Mm. So Kierkegaard says, well, God told Abraham to do this and had every intention of going through with it, but then at the last moment um, decides, I see that you have faith. And 
And it's okay that God played with him that way because God knew that the end justifies the means. Well, I, obviously I wrestle with that. I, mean, I, I disagree with that. I, that's just not my view. Um, here's, here's the thing, though. If, if Kierkegaard had been able, I think, to realize that God is not limited in time. He's not bound by time like you and me. I think maybe he would have arrived at a different conclusion. Um, because he, in my view, time answers to God. Time is bound. Time, which is, think about this, time by its very definition is temporary. If, if you were going to compare time to eternity, how, how would you even begin to do that? So, you, you know, you could try to demonstrate it by saying the things that are eternal are so much bigger than time. But if, if I wanted to draw it, how would I draw a big circle? Would that be big enough to draw eternity? Could I put the circle of eternity all the way around time? Well, would this whiteboard be big enough? Could we draw a circle as big as this building? Would that even begin to put it in perspective for us? No. If, if you drew the circle of eternity and you even just made it encompass all of Buckeye compared to this little box of time, see, would that even do it? No. Time punches in on the time clock to God. And the Bible says there will be a time when time will be no more. In other words, I can just see time coming into God's desk and saying, just checking in, and God says, I no longer need your services. Time is, is bound and, and eternal is massive and huge. Now, so here's, here's the way in, in my thinking that I look at this story. We're, again, we're just hitting this quickly. We'll move on to another text. But we're talking about Isaac. God never intended for Abraham to offer his son. But God truly knew that he had already planned for his own son, Jesus Christ, slain from the foundation of the world to cover all of the sin of humanity. That if we just express faith in him that he washes away all of our sin. And, and I just want to touch on this for a moment. Um, there are amazing encounters in the Bible that I, I think really defy um, explanation from a human standpoint. For instance, you've got Jesus up on the mountain of transfiguration flanked by Eli Elijah and Moses. And, and he's just carrying on conversation with them. And Peter, James, and John are doing just like you and I would do. They're worshiping. And Peter, who is always running his mouth, you know, some people speak because they have something to say. And then some people speak because they just have to say something. Right? <laughs> and, and Peter apparently was one of those. It, Lord, this is amazing. Let us build three tabernacles. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And then the booming voice of God, this is my beloved son, with him I am well pleased. Now, um, I guess my brain starts thinking this way. So how did that happen? How does Peter, uh, uh, not Peter, but how does Jesus stand at one place in one moment, in one eternal moment, with Elijah and Moses at the same time? Well, obviously, you can say, but it's in eternity. Yeah, of course it is. I mean, that's stating the obvious. And, and I suppose that you could say, well, okay, Moses and Elijah had already died. Um, they are now in eternity. And I go with you there, absolutely. But here's, here's something that's interesting to me, is that both Moses and Elijah had key moments in their lives where they ascended to the top of a mountain. And Moses received the law on top of the mountain 40 days 
in God's presence. And Elijah ascends to the top of the mountain. And at the most desperate moment of his life, God speaks to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? And gives him an encouragement and lifts him in his spirit. He, see, he sees the fire. He sees the earthquake. He, he, he feels the force of the wind. But it says God was not in any of those things. But then came a still small voice. And God spoke to Elijah. And based upon the strength that he received on the top of the mountain, what does he do? He runs all the way, outruns a chariot and um, uh, in, in the strength of God. So to me, how does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen in a time-bound way. I just, I'm radical enough to believe that God, who is eternal, is so much bigger than time that it may have been an eternal moment that happened in a bleeding through way into eternal, into temporary time. But here's just the interesting thing about this is that Abraham is told, go and sacrifice your son Isaac. Abraham, the father, loves his son. God loved his son. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. I mean, even to the point of raising up the knife. I mean, it must have been so horrible in his heart. And the voice of the angel says, Stop, Abraham. I have provided the ram for you in the thicket, and, and the sacrifice occurs that way. Abraham was willing to sacrifice his son. God did sacrifice his son. Isaac, it says, carried the wood up the mountain. Jesus carried the cross up Golgotha. There's so many parallels. And... Um, so, so much beauty here in, in this story. And I even believe that um, there is, uh, there's, there's innuendo, things that don't really transpire, don't come out in the, the story that we have to, um, you know, maybe we could guess at and, and speculate, well, maybe this happened or that. For instance, it, it speaks of the father carrying the very implements of of the sacrifice. And I just wonder because when when we hear the story of Jesus dying on the cross, we read it in in the Bible. It, we are we're time trapped. We're time travelers. People say you can't travel through time. Yeah, you do it every day. You've done it every moment of your life. You're traveling through time. You're doing it at one speed. There's no reverse gear. I wish I had a reverse gear sometimes. Uh, you can't speed up. You move at the speed of time and you travel through time. But, but Jesus, um, when his entire crucifixion and all of that, we're viewing it from our vantage point. We don't get to hear the heart of the Father. What did it do to God the Father's heart? I think Mel Gibson depicted it beautifully in The Passion of the Christ with one single solitary tear falling from heaven. And then... It splashes on the cross, and then this horrendous storm happens. Um, it's it's just it's beautiful um, this this story, and Isaac that really that shaped him though. It, can you imagine now? He comes back down off the mountain. He realizes, you know, I was I was a goner. I was good as dead. I would have relinquished my life if that was required. But the Father supplied everything we needed. And God gave a sacrifice. And I didn't have to die. I mean, that, that's amazing. So now um, you go to Genesis chapter 24. And um, now Isaac has grown up. And um, it's time for him to get married. And so Abraham sends his servant on a trip to try to find uh, a wife for Isaac, his son. And you read down here, 
at verse 49, these words, So now, if you are going to deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me. If not, let me know that, it, that I can turn to the right or to the left. Will you do what my master is asking? In this story, you're, you're probably familiar with it. If you're not, then just know that three different times uh, in the course of the story, you have the servant of Abraham asking uh, Rebecca and asking Laban and asking um, again at three different points in the story, will you do what's right for my master? And there's, again, just a wonderful parallel for our lives. Will we, who, we are the bride of Christ. Um, in, in the Jewish tradition, the representative came, approached the family, asked, will you marry my, my uh, master? Carries the bride back. And um, that is identical to what the scripture speaks of Jesus coming for his bride. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18, the bride of Christ snatched up, caught up in an instant to be with the Lord forever and ever. The, the very next unfolding is the marriage supper of the Lamb. Um, we are the bride of Christ, and I, I hear the same sentiment echoing out from our, our Lord uh, to us today. Will you do what's right for my Master? And then if you go on to uh, chapter 26, by the way, these are the things that shaped Isaac. Um, his birth. He had heard the story his whole life. You were named laughter because we all just laughed. I mean, we're, and then we laughed again when you were actually born the fulfillment of promise. And, and then um, when you were such and such age, Remember your father taking you up on the mountain he had heard from God? You were about to be sacrificed, but God provided for you so that you didn't. And then when it was time for him to be married, then the servant goes off and, and brings back a bride for him. And these are the things that are shaping Isaac. Now, by chapter 26, things are really getting desperate. Um, Isaac is in, in real dire straits here. It says, verse 1, Now there was a famine in the land, besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, and the Philistines. And the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I will tell you. So he obeyed. Now it's, it's interesting that that the Lord told him not to go to Egypt. Because remember that later on, his descendants would go to Egypt. They would be slaves in Egypt for 430 years. The, the very place that God is saying, do not go to Egypt, and Isaac obeys and he doesn't go. But when... when when his ancestor or his descendants, when they go to Egypt, 430 years there in that land, the first part of that stay is blessed. Um, Joseph is raised up to a high level position, second in command. And boy, just for a while, it's just peaches and roses. It's just sweet. It's nice. And then, but as it went further along, um, they became such a threat to the Egyptians that now they're slaves and and the workload is unbearable and it's just uh, so hard the task being put upon them and you know all of that story and how Moses delivered them and, and God gave the signs of the plagues and all of that but isn't it interesting that Isaac was told don't go to Egypt it's the reason it's interesting is because that's the very place that you would go if it were a famine he, he's in a situation where they can't find water. Um, they don't have proper food. And, and his intent, his natural inclination would be to go to Egypt. God says, don't go. And sometimes, just think of this, sometimes God will tell other people to do things that he won't tell you to do. Maybe, maybe he'll have them go to Egypt and you're not to go to Egypt. 
What I mean by that is that God might have you right where you're supposed to be, doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Maybe it's a timing thing. Maybe you're going to go to Egypt later on. Who knows? But he, the amazing thing is that he stayed in this very difficult situation. And if you read the whole story, and I won't read it, but um, basically he had to start digging for wells. And uh, the first, first time he found a well, um, he was happy about finding water, but then there was grumbling and bickering over it. And somebody said, how dare you? That's our land. You can't have that water. So he does it again. He goes to a new location. They set up the equipment. I don't even know what the primitive equipment would have looked like in those days. They start digging again. They dig for another well. They found another well. Rejoicing in the camp. We have strong water in the very same thing. Here come the people saying, you can't dig there. That's our land. That's our water. You better leave that alone. And, I mean, it was, it was life or death. It was famine. It was very, very serious. Let me tell you, water rights are really serious, huh? Mm -hmm. I, I'm telling you, in Colorado, water is big. It's, it is a big deal. Um, I don't know if you know this, but the Colorado River runs to supply water for Arizona and for California. Um, we had people in our church, the, the wife was fairly faithful to church. The husband was very hit and miss. I mean, he would come every once in a while. I, I don't mean this the wrong way, but can I just tell you a little joke among pastors? There's some people who call them CEOs. <laughs> Christmas and Easter only. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, one of the saddest days in our ministry is when Stephanie and I, we got a phone call, would you, would you come help me move out of our spread because the husband had been sent to prison and we helped her, the wife, and their son move out of a beautiful Swedish style ranch with, I mean, literally had riding stable on the bottom floor, special built stuff in between the floors so that the smell of the animals doesn't come up to the top floor. The top floor was just gorgeous. They had, I don't know how many acres, riding horses, and just was beautiful. And uh, he went to prison, and the reason he went to prison was because he, he got so angry one time fighting with a neighbor over water rights that he, he just snapped and um, attacked him and went off to prison. Well, water rights is a big deal. And, and so Isaac, here he is. Now he digs a third well. And this time they leave him alone and they let him enjoy the well. And he names the well plenty of space. Yeah, I love that. Or let's put it in modern vernacular. He names the well Elbow Room. <laughs> and he was he was just so um, so thrilled and so blessed. And um, I, you know the life of Isaac it just encourages me, and that's the the main thing tonight. I hope that I hope that you leave encouraged. I don't know if you're digging well number one or digging well number three. Um, I don't know if it feels like you're about to be sacrificed. Where are you in the journey? But there is an amazing verse, Psalm 2, that, you know, I've talked to you about the laughter happening and, and how they name Yitzchak, he laughs. But... Psalm 2 just has one amazing line. Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his altar and against his anointed. Let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Look at verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Now, what is going on here is that um, it, God is just having a hearty laugh. You can, you can picture the most brilliant minds of the world sitting at the conference table trying to figure out how they're going to be strong and be number one and be world powers. And God in heaven gets hot. He laughs. 
Um, there's a phrase that is used in Genesis 31, verse 42, and, and also verse 53. The fear of Isaac. Fear of Isaac. What is the fear of Isaac? Well, without going into too much detail, because it, it is time to wind down, but there's a beautiful symbolism of the fear of Isaac. It, apparently the name, that, that little tag, fear of Isaac, came about just because Isaac reverenced the Lord so much that later on, people, when they looked back to him, thought it was a beautiful thing. Wouldn't it be a good thing if we could have the same kind of reverence of Isaac? The same kind of fear of God that Isaac had. So um, it, it, it's reverence, it's awestruck for God Almighty. And, and it's talking about just the beautiful life of submission that, God, that Isaac did before God. Isaac was a, a, a wonderful, wonderful man. And someday when we get to heaven, I'd love to swap stories with him and hear some of the inside scoop because there were just incredible things that happened in his life. And I pray that his life encourages you. Let's bow our heads together, in fact, right now and, and pray. Thank you. Dear God, we thank you very much for the, for the beauty of Holy Scripture. Thank you for the life story of Isaac, the way that he ministers to us even today. Father, I pray that when we're going through difficult times, you will help us to just throw our head back and just have a belly ache and laugh in the midst of turmoil. Sometimes we just, we get so serious. Help us to, to laugh and to enjoy every moment of life. Because Isaac, life, his life shows us that even if it feels like we're right at the point that we're going to be sacrificed, no, you've already provided the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. You look out for us. You, you watch out for us. You say that we are the apple of your eye. Thank you, God. And for some of us, we might be really upset and, and frustrated because we've been working so hard and it doesn't seem like things are coming together. We never know. We might be on well number one, we might be on well number two. It could be any time that you bless our lives with a life-giving artesian well, and we're able to say, ah, oh, plenty of elbow room. Thank you, God, that you work in our lives. It could be that right now you're saying to us, don't you go to Egypt, but maybe later on we'll go to Egypt. We, we don't have to know all of those things. We just, we trust you. We trust you, Lord. We trust you. And we know that as we're seeing the fulfillment of prophecy all around the world, literally, our God in heaven is not shaken. And sometimes you just laugh. You must laugh at it all. God in heaven laughs. Teach us to laugh with you and enjoy every moment of this, of this life. We ask all of this in the wonderful name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. 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 God bless all of you. See you back here Sunday morning.